All right. Um, okay, hopefully I'm recording. Um, so if you have any questions or anything, just shoot in. Um, so first off, we'll start off by talking about emphasis and focal point, which directly correlates to um, our study on composition. So composition is something that ultimately is sort of embedded in you. Uh, we talked about that at length when we did a, a, the full composition lecture. But focal point is, is sort of the main concentration and at least what we'll be sort of unpacking today. So focal point is just simply the point or emphasis in an image or design. Obviously the focal point in this is what? The orange. The orange. Um, and how do we know that? Because it's the only one that has like bright colors. Yeah, so there's a little game that we play on um, Sesame Street. It's called, uh, and I remember it from when I was a child, one of these things is not like the other. Um, and it's a whole song. And ultimately, the color, the contrast, and the, the temperature of this very thing tells us that, it, that it's a focal point. Also, the center of the image in general ha occupies a big weight, a big visual weight. So the element emphasized in a picture can attract attention and it encourages the viewer to look further. Once, if there is not a focal point, oftentimes we can see an image as a pattern and lose visual interest. So a tip, there are hundreds of thousands of images in front of us every single day. What then can create a focal point? Well, when you utilize a focal point, you ultimately discern or allow your viewer to spend more time on an image. So what we're looking at here is an Henri Matisse and his bathers. It's a very famous image. He did a whole series of it. Know though that there can be one more, more than one focal point in an image. In this image, we have three major components that are disparate from the background. And they're disparate in both temperature, their color, in their value, their lighter, and the fact that they are similar. Now, they're similar in a variety of ways, but they're similar, and like elements attract the eye. That's a rule I would love for you guys to remember. Um, it's a rule I walked out of school with and that I still use today. Like elements will pull the eye across. And so what you're seeing here is ultimately you moving from one uh, figure to the next. A second focal point might be referred to as an accent or counterpoint, okay? Um, so the focal point in this particular image also has a secondary focal point, which will be ultimately this little turtle. And the turtle is unlike anything else in this picture plane. But we know that it's important narratively because all of these figures are gesturing or looking towards it, okay? So you don't wanna have too many areas of focus you do want to carefully plan out and hierarchically assemble them. What does that mean hierarchically? Let me admit this person. Um, hierarchically, you're establishing um, the value, the importance of, right? These three figures are incredibly important. They're the most important, but this turtle is secondary because we see that they're engaging with it. So I've also got abstract, abstracts and patterns can also have focal points. Absolutely they can because all of these things are simply just shapes. And when those shapes are configured in a certain way that allow us maybe a suggested line or a directional thrust, right? What we're getting here is an abstract image essentially. When everything is emphasized, nothing is emphasized. So whenever you just have pattern, ultimately we are completely depleting an image of a focal point. All right, there are three major ways to develop emphasis. You can emphasize by contrast, you can emphasize by isolation, and you can emphasize by placement. This image has all three of those. So what is the focal point of this image? Somebody help me out. I'm gonna ask you questions, so turn them on. What do you think the focal point is? What is it? Is it the, the tree? Yeah. What's telling you that it's the tree? The, the like, yeah, and it takes up like most of the um picture. Good. What yeah, else? I was basically just gonna say like it was like the largest and like darkest object to like that you can like perceive. 
So we've got two things that you've just illustrated. Emphasis by contrast, it's the darkest thing. Emphasis by placement, it sort of like occupies the majority of the picture plane, right? It's almost, it's also almost in the complete center, right? So placement and scale. And then how is it isolated? Is it isolated? Um, well, it's next to the houses, which are white. Good. Um, Good. Do you have another thing to add to that? No, yeah, that was just and um and maybe the sky too. yeah so we've got all these things around this tree that are kind of flat right this is a really flat smooth area really flat and smooth really flat and smooth really flat and smooth okay we got some jaggedness going on here in these shapes as we go back but the thing is is this really is the organic thing in this picture plane that dominates it's organic it's got lots and lots of gnarly edges right and so that creates a sense of isolation of this shape. One of these things is not like the other. So you can, you can ultimately achieve emphasis in a variety of ways. You can isolate that element just like we talked about. You can change the direction of the shapes or lines. You can make one element distorted. So like, oh, you know, we have a really quite, you know, really well drawn photorealist image and then we have something that's incredibly wonky right intentionally wonky um so you can distort it in general we can change the size of one object we can change the shape of one object so just like we talked about the color like the orange still life and then of course you can change the brightness of one object so when you have a lot of things together that are the same you have to think about the way the way and how much to turn up the difference of that thing. So, emphasis by contrast. Uh, many things of all one style, color, shape, placement, etc., plus one element that is opposite. So it's it may sound really formulaic, but ultimately contrast allows us a way to recognize immediately that something is different. So in this image here, the contrast being the pattern of the uh, the zebra, right? Um, the contrast of the zebra being an extreme white within that pattern that is created on, on its body is very, very different than this very organic, non-graphic foliage surrounding it, right? Um, if we're thinking about something like uh, difference, right, and we're trying to make something a little wonky, we have the reverse of that. We have all these very, very, very stylized faces on the right Everybody's a color that isn't quite, you know, naturalistic. And then we have that one guy in the center with that red hat. And he's looking at us. He's the only one really looking at us. And he's the only really naturalistically rendered figure. One of these things is not like the other. So instead of creating a kind of pattern, we know to look at him, that he is important to our narrative. All of this comes together to equal a point of focus. This is also called emphasis by contrast, okay? Very simple. All right, we've got two images here that deal with the notion of isolation. So if you take the repetition of the same object over and over and have just one of these things off by itself, you're gonna create an obvious emphasis. The slide down here, apart from all the other slides up top, and sorry, youngins, slides are what we used to use in an art, art class to show images. Um, when you take that thing and you literally physically segregate it, you're gonna have isolation, okay? On the image to the right, that's a famous Thomas Iggins painting of uh, the Agnew Clinic. He, Agnew, we can infer, is right here because he's completely isolated, he's engaging with the audience, he's physically away from the goings on. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. Can any of you see my cursor moving? Yes. Excellent, okay. Yeah. So he, he is both isolated by contrast, but mostly by isolation, okay? And that isolation that he has away from the actual action is creating a kind of, um, is creating a kind of a focal point for us. 
All right, it's important not to place the point of focus too close to the edge as it will pull the viewer's eye off the page. So the question is, is what would happen if we took him and we stuck him and butted him right against this picture, the actual picture plane itself? What would happen if we took this slide and we put it over here or at the very, very bottom of the black? What would happen is, is A, that creates a visual discomfort, which you've heard me say before, but it also literally pulls the eye off of the page. And you want your objective in composition is to keep the eye moving around the picture plane, never exiting, shoof, never just flying right off. And so there's a variety of devices that keep us, let's say, within this picture, the Agnew Clinic, which is a very famous image, by the way. We have this open space here, but then we have a really, really complicated space on the opposite side. We have this really, really light form, but then we have really, really dark forms up here. We have this round shape here that is essentially the stage. And this round shape literally frames the picture within the picture, okay? And then we have this successive movement towards real darkness, a light face in the, in the uh, front, a medium value here in the middle, and then we get darker and darker and darker. And so we have a lot to look at in this picture plane, even though it isn't terribly busy. So if we think about these two images here relating to placement, the first image, it says, our eyes are drawn to the center element of this design by the, all the elements radiating from it. It creates implied line, right? There's a directionality to all these things because it's kind of like, psychologically, a finger pointing. And that suggestion of what we already know, which is directionality, creates a kind of arrow that says, hey, y'all, look here, okay? Now, we can also do that through shapes. In this particular image, what we have is perspective. One point perspective that goes all the way, look at, look at this line here, all the way to one point along our horizon line. And where is that point? Right here. So she is our focal point. She's our focal point for a variety of different reasons. She has light cast directly on her. The perspectival lines lead all the way back to her Almost every single one leads literally to her lower back. And we have this differentiating pattern that is across her back that almost literally looks like, guess what? An arrow saying, look here. So when we combine these elements and these rules that we know, we can ultimately tell the viewer, hey, she's important. So all of these things lead us to what you, what you want your viewer to look at and what you want them to notice. So some tips on where to actually place a focal point. Don't use the dead center. It's called the dead center for a reason. It absolutely is. We call that a target composition. You don't want a target composition. The only time that you actually want to use a tar target composition, meaning dead center, your focal point is in the dead center, is when you're trying to make a religious image. Because ultimately, everything around it needs to navigate around it and point to the center, right? Generally, you want to put something kind of off-center, all right? You also never want to put the focal point too close to the edge of the picture pane, plane, or it will just immediately have the viewer's eye go, whew, it'll fall right off of the edge like a, like a, like a little boxcar, all right? The third tip is have something like the gaze or direction of the object pointing back to the composition. Um, like the, let's say, the gazes of the men in the surgical theater, right? They're all, look sorry, there's someone revving a car outside my window. <laughs> I apologize, guys. Hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, maybe the gaze of an actual person or the actual um, shape of a thing. All right. What about the degree of emphasis? In the degree of emphasis, what we want to do is we want to think about how that specific theme may at times call for a dominant, even visually overwhelming focal point, okay? So the red umbrella here not only tells us that this person is important, it tells us that they're different, psychologically different. All right. The focal point should remain related to and part of the overall design. How is this related to the entirety of the design? It's the same shape. All right. This is a really important image. Does anybody know it?
Anybody ever seen this image at all? Yeah. Do you know anything about it? Um, I know it was <clears throat> based on um, a battle that had taken place, I think, in Spain, and the army ended up shooting a lot of, you know, some civilians, some really? people that were fighting, um, and it kind of became a call to arms of the people yeah. um, because of what happened there. So Spain was run by a monarchy uh, in the 19th century, early 19th century, and Napoleon Bonaparte was a giant colonizer and he basically tried to convince his you know the french uh populace that the f that th the spaniards needed to be liberated from their uh, monarchy i don't like the kings and queens running anything in europe and so i'm going to invade for you they're going to welcome us us with open arms and um we're going to convert them to a d democracy which which is what we are right um, even though really, you know, Napoleon was more of a, uh, an oligarch than anything. So, um, France invaded Spain, went in and they were not met with open arms. Most, in fact, half of their army were mercenaries. And what a mercenary is, is, is a soldier that's paid from somewhere else. So half of them, are, somebody needs to mute, please. Uh, make sure everybody's mute. Great. Um, they were mercenaries, which means they were paid and they were not actually French. They have nothing to lose. They invade Spain, a peaceful country that had nothing to do with them for the most part. For the most part, uh, they were not always very peaceful. And they did terrible things. Uh, they raped and pillaged. They would take babies from mother's arms and they would throw them up in the air and, and, and impale them on bayonets. I mean, beyond cruel. Beyond cruel. And this is the 5th of May, which is what this painting is called, the 5th of May. And it's painted by Francisco Goya. And Goya, for almost all, most of his career, was actually employed by the Spanish monarchy, by the kings and queens of Spain. And he was a court painter. And so he saw what was going on. He was actually witness to it. And he painted it. Uh, and he painted this as a means, it, Karen's absolutely right, as a kind of call to arms. It's an important image when it comes to composition. Let's break it down. We have one light source. That light source is illuminating just a certain small section of an image. We have the directional gaze of our actors actually pointing away from the picture plane. Remember, bring the eye back in. And they're literally pointing with their bayonets, with their bay bayonets and guns, to our emblem. And our emblem is a man. He's a general Spaniard, and he happens to be wearing white, which, 10 points to Gryffindor, what's white mean, y'all? When I Christ, read... purity. Yeah? In warfare, what does white mean? Surrender. Good. So by implication, we have a peaceful people who, in this painting, are meeting with complete surrender, Okay. We have unnecessary bloodshed. We have people literally facing, literally facing, encompassing in the figure here. So when we think about them as shapes. And then we have this giant V shape, right? And this V shape is where our eyes are going to go, boom, down here, where our soldiers end and the beginning of the point begins. And we have this created tension between the, the scoop of the man's shirt and the ends of the blade itself which is ultimately about this moment in time. This little area of negative space is really, really important narratively because what it says is this is the moment before the edge meets its intention. The moment before death. So it's an incredibly profoundly impactful and emotional image, but it's also doing that through his use of composition. So... We do have absence of focal point, um, especially when we're thinking about the modernist painters of the 60s and 70s in the United States, and they still exist today. We have Lee Krasner, who is actually married to Jackson Pollock, um, very well known as well. And we have what's called the all over effect in design or in painting. The all over effect means that it goes from edge to edge and everything is treated in the exact same way and there is an absence of focal point. So. What that happens is a repeating motif. You oftentimes see this in fabric and wallpaper. And you can generally draw attention to design, a design simply by not using a focal point. 
Um, so that actually can happen depending on how you actually treat the surface of the thing. All right.